some places hide a wealth of secrets. Discovering and exploring them leads us back to the origins of all life. It may be the coming together of different worlds which gives water and riverbank that special magnetism which has attracted us since early childhood, or simply the play of light that casts a spell over water, air and land. Perhaps it is also the flowing movement, dazzling both eye and ear with its diversity and leaving in its wake shapes and forms which offer that longed-for counterbalance to our smooth, technological world. The roots of humankind lie in a prehistoric biotope. Perhaps this is also why we long for an environment that resembles this ancient habitat. The mysterious beauty of living nature is nourishment for the soul. We only live to discover beauty, and everything else is a kind of anticipation. A fisherman has been down at the stream since early morning. The abundance of imagery has already long since taken his mind away from fishing. He knows them all, the enchanting spots, hiding places and patterns in the current, and above all, the creatures to be seen here. And yet, for him too, they are new and fascinating every time. For instance, the dipper, or oozel, which, in its constant search for food, dives down to the floor of the stream. The small tributary channels are full of wonderful creatures. On damp nights, the fire salamander comes down to the water and deposits its larvae in the small, clear pools. They are still breathing through gills, but in a few months they will emerge from the water as yellow, black, speckled amphibians spending the rest of their lives as land animals. A person moving along the bank quietly and at a steady pace has a good chance of seeing even rare and shy residents of the stream. After a dive, the iridescent kingfisher rests on branches hanging low over the water. The kingfisher is a member of a bird species native to the tropics. Small and richly coloured, it is skilled at fishing and watching it is worth a trip all of its own. On the opposite bank of the side stream, a grass snake is on the move. It is obviously on the lookout for prey. From here, it will be in a better position to scrutinize the tangled root system.
and sure enough, it manages to catch a fish, bringing it immediately to safety. Like all snakes, the grass snake unhinges its jaw in order to widen its gullet for this huge mouthful. It is precisely through such spectacles that the interrelations in a nature-dependent food chain are revealed. Stoneflies are only found in clean, flowing water. They too form a significant element in the aquatic food chain. Thorough knowledge of their way of life and appearance will bring the fishermen success. A usable imitation may be found in the fly box. It's worth a try. The location looks promising. Meticulously, the artificial fly is tied to the extremely fine leader. Fishermen have their own complicated looking knots. How secure they are depends largely on how well they are tied. Modern monofilaments allow ever thinner diameters, which means that a good cast material, just 1 20th of an inch thick, can comfortably take a weight of 6 pounds. But look out! Knots considerably reduce their resistance to breaking, especially if they have been tied carelessly. The fisherman suspects a good trout is situated a short distance upstream. From out of his cover, the fly fisherman attempts to position his stonefly in the most promising place. Such close proximity to the location demands minimal movement and careful presentation in order not to disturb the site. One fish has allowed itself to be deceived. It first seeks to escape into the depths of the pool, but the hook sits tight and it is forced to return. This exquisite brightly colored brown trout is typically found in medium sized and small streams. With so little space, the struggle is not spectacular. But neither is it yet over. A further flight ensues. The brown trout is now visibly exhausted and the fisherman can remove it from the hook. The magnificent creature shall live to see another day. Anyone who fishes without a barb can easily release the fish without injury. Resting gently on the floor of the stream, the fish recovers from its adventure. Not only winged insects are of interest to the fly fishermen, underwater too there is an abundant range of food. Only a person familiar with the diet currently available will be successful, and this requires a closer examination of the floor of the stream. Our fisherman finds the larvae of a free-living caddisfly of the species Ryacophila.
The thick growth of vegetation on the bank of the stream forms a large number of nooks and crannies, which are important and indeed essential for the development and survival of countless creatures. But for a fisherman who has a close bond with nature, life both on and within the floor of the stream is of particular significance. Under the stones, on the plants and in the gravel, a system of spaces with free-flowing water provides living space, a safe haven and food source for many species. Three square feet of stream floor or riverbed can accommodate up to a hundred thousand living creatures, up to three feet in depth. A flat mayfly larvae of the species Epiorus has retreated here. This hydropsyche larvae, another species of caddisfly, is around half an inch in size. Its white gill tufts are visible on the side. Hydropsyche larvae are predators, like the larvae of Ryokophila, and seek out other insects to attack. The Epiorus nymph is an extremely flat mayfly larva from the family of the Heptagineidae. It is the only mayfly nymph species to have only two tail appendages. Most caddis worms drag their intricately constructed dwelling cases around with them. This mayfly nymph must have found its way here purely by mistake. In the banks of flowing streams, it digs out dwelling cases from the sand or mud. The wafting tracheal gills are clearly visible on its back. Caddis worms construct their dwelling cases from varied materials, either like the brown case from fragments of vegetation or from very fine grains of sand. The dwelling case grows with the larva, which means that each time it sheds its skin, the larva makes its case a bit bigger. Inside the case, the larvae move about and are able to turn around. This is the larva of a well-known pest, the black fly. Just underneath, a hydropsyche has built itself a dwelling nest. Across the front of its hollow, it has stretched out a tiny net, which it uses to catch suitable prey, small aquatic creatures and algae. The net is scarcely a quarter of an inch in size, and the mesh size is just a few hundredths of an inch. Knowledge of the appearance and living habits of the insects and other creatures which make up the diet of fish is the basis of fly fishing. Creating a lifelike imitation of these tiny creatures and then presenting it in the right way, this is the high art of fishing in harmony with nature. But for lifelike imitation, appearance alone is not enough. Movement, light refraction and stimulation are important factors. This procedure shows how the legs of a hydropsyche larva are copied using a special twisting technique. Our fisherman, Erhard Leudel, is one of the most creative fly tyres in Austria and Europe. He has developed a whole range of materials for his passion and is continually devising new ideas. For fly tying, special tools and aids have been invented. The hook, for instance, is held in place by a small screwing stick or vice, and the tying thread is fed using a special spool carrier or bobbin.
a clever device facilitates finishing off with a concealed head knot. Some designs require finishing with a brush so that even the tiniest fibers may have their effect. Using a waterproof felt tip pen, important color characteristics can then be added too. The whole tying procedure is shown here in real time. In other words, the film has not been cut. The insect and its imitation. As insects go through various metamorphoses, it is not enough just to imitate the larva stage. Once again, Earhart dubs using especially fine quality iridescent body material. The feeling for the right quantity and smooth application are essential at this stage of the work. In the case of caddisflies, transformation into a flying insect takes place via the pupa stage. Rising and hatching of the pupa particularly attracts fish, since the activity entails a lot of movement. So-called risers, hatches or emergers are indispensable when fishing with caddisfly imitations. The rump feathers of a duck are ideally suited to adding play of movement to an imitation. There exists a whole variety of tying and processing techniques. Creativity and experimentation know no boundaries. Here, Erhard Leudel is showing us a splaying technique which is particularly suitable for pupae which move as they hatch. It makes the hackles stick together less in the water, allowing more vigorous movement. Rising and hatching does indeed take place with vigorous movements. For this reason, with these designs in particular, an exact imitation is less important than key stimuli such as independent movement and the light refraction effects created on the surface of the water. thorax is dubbed again. So-called dubbing, the application of a whole range of fiber mixtures to the tying thread, provides the fly tire with broad scope for creative design, not only in terms of application techniques, but also choice of materials and the combining and testing of these materials for buoyancy, independent movement, light refraction, stiffness and much more. An exact and tidy finish is essential for a properly proportioned imitation. The insect is imitated either before or during shedding of its pupil sheath.
Spider's fly pupa is hatching. With surface emerges, the actual hatching process takes only a few seconds. And finally, the winged insect is also worth imitating. Here, it is done very realistically. The wings are simulated using a specially treated plastic film material. The cut requires a great deal of experience and knowledge as to the right form and proportion. Now the legs are made from a different stiffer material. Here it is a mixture of hollow hair. Winged insects are mainly presented as dry flies on the surface and should therefore have a certain degree of buoyancy. Foam bodies and hollow hair dubbing, preferably from the hair of roe deer or stag, may be helpful here. Larva, rising pupa and flying insect at a glance. In the case of conspicuous caddisfly activity, all three designs can be highly effective. Of course, in order to be successful, the appropriate presentation technique, casting and holding the line, is extremely important. The next morning, Earhart Loidel is down at the river early. When the morning mist disperses and the first rays of the sun reach the surface of the water, some insects become very active. The graylings too are on the lookout. More than all other types of fishing, Fly fishing demands skill and a feeling for movement. Rod and line must be in tune with one another. What here appears so simple and elegant is the perfect interplay of the action of the rod and the impetus of the hand casting the line. In addition, there is the decision as to where and how far The fisherman either spots active fish and casts his line to them, or he fishes on spec at promising spots, current courses, eddies or crossing points. The aim is to present active fish with imitations of their natural prey, either on the surface or, as here, under water. The graylings appear to be interested in the nymph but the close proximity of the underwater camera then makes them suspicious. Some places on the river demand a whole repertoire of clever casting techniques, especially if the space behind the fisherman is not big enough for him to throw his line back. It becomes particularly difficult when the sun is high and is even illuminating the shady ravine. The fish are now cautious. Our fishermen can easily be seen from the water.
the line must be cast further and further. With some success, a superb grayling has taken. Even though the risk exists of losing the fish, Earhart keeps the struggle as short as possible. The fish is not supposed to completely exhaust itself. Ultimately, it is released, and all the wiser for the experience. It will now be even more difficult to catch. Fly fishing is not a sport, for contact with a living creature cannot be a sport. Neither is fly fishing a philosophy of life. Nevertheless, it demands an attitude marked by love and knowledge of nature. Only then are the elegance and beauty revealed which lie within this passion. It is an activity full of concentration and exciting moments but also full of many minor disappointments demanding patience on the part of the fisherman. In this way, the fly fisherman does not just remain an observer, he also becomes a participant. <laughs> 